Okay. So, um, so we looked at personal worship, and uh, so this is one way, right? Doesn't mean that uh, every time this is a this is a guideline, which we see in Hebrews chapter ten to draw near with boldness, to you know to be to have that awareness of uh, of being washed uh, and also uh, you know being washed and cleansed and so on, and we we draw near with sincere heart and full assurance of faith. So this is something that we are invited. Right, all of us, and and it's, it's good if we can do this every time, right? On our in our personal time with God, to draw near to Him and to offer sacrifice of praise, thanksgiving, and uh, you know worship Him with the word, praise Him with the word, and also you know do it in with tongues, right? So so what happens when we worship Him, when we personally praise God or worship God, right? We looked at. Some of these things just want to, by way of reminder, okay, what happens? It says Psalm 34, sorry, so Psalm 22, we see that God inhabits our praises, right? He's enthroned on the praises of his people, which means that his rule and reign is something that we experience, right? He's in, like, let's read Psalm 22, verse 3. It says, You are holy, enthroned in the praises of Israel. Okay, that he's a holy God and he's enthroned. To be enthroned means to be to rule and reign. The one who is on the throne is the one who rules and reigns, right? See, he's enthroned on the praises of his people. So, what happens when we praise God? The Bible declares this spiritual principle that he is actually enthroned on the praises of his people. That doesn't mean that if we don't praise him, he's not on the throne, right? If we don't praise him, he's not ruling. But when we praise him, you know, we experience the truth of the fact that he is enthroned, right? Because what we, what do we praise him? What do we praise him for? And what do we praise him with? We praise him with the truth, right? We praise, praise him and say, God, you are, you are the king of kings, but you are the healer, right? You are the deliverer, right? You are the provider, right? We bring all that as, Lord, this is what you did in the past. And I praise you that this is what you can do right now. So we are actually coming in agreement with the truth of God's word. Right? Every time we praise God, we are coming in agreement. Right? Every time we sing a song of praise, you know, we are coming in agreement with truth. And this agreeing with truth from the depths of our heart is so important to experience the power of truth. Because what happens is when we come in agreement, we are coming you know, in faith. We are, we are displaying faith. We are releasing faith, right? And when we release faith, or when we ex when we walk in faith, we experience the power of that very truth that we that we proclaim, right? And of course, it's not a formula, right? We know it based on relationship with God, based on our intimacy with God. You know, from that place of intimacy and relationship, right? We declare, uh, we proclaim. We come in agreement and we experience the power of that truth. So we experience that hey, God is reigning and ruling when I praise him. Right? So when, when he is enthroned, then a lot of other things happen. Right? The second thing that we see in 2 Chronicles 20 is that praise causes divine deliverance. Right? 2 Chronicles 20 reads about kings, uh, you know, we read about King Jeho Jehoshaphat and, and what he did. <clears throat> He praised, excuse me, he put people in front of the army to praise him, to declare his praise, and that is what he did. And the Bible declares that as the people praised, that as these worshippers worshipped, that God set ambushes, right? So as God set in confusion in the, among the enemy, so they were destroyed, right? They were defeated, 2 Chronicles 20, 22, right? So praise is something that causes deliverance and deliverance which is done divinely in God's way. And so it goes beyond logic sometimes. It goes beyond our reasoning at times, right? We see that example in, um, in, in Acts chapter 16, right? Where we see Paul and, and Silas and they are gathered, they are there in the, in the prison. They are arrested in the prison and they begin to pray, they begin to sing. That is what we see. They begin to sing, right? Now, 
that earthquake happening at that point at that you know at that right time was it a natural occurrence or was it something that was supernatural well we can debate it but the fact is that they did something which was quite radical they sang praises to god they sang to god they praising they were praying and they experience deliverance right so so that is something for us to put to practice right so when we face oppression when we face you know satanic oppression spiritual darkness just begin to praise the lord i remember you know when uh, i was working for this organizations so i was working in uh, in sales right and so i was um, uh, i was feeling very uh, weighed down by the pressure the pressure to perform weighed down because uh, i had not done well the entire month so uh, in that organization if you if you don't if you didn't perform for two months straight you were out you were out without a job right so i knew that okay uh, this was this was early days when there was a baby at home and and all that i was, I was thinking god you know this is one month has gone the second month is also not do, i'm doing doing too well so i don't know what's going to happen so i'm thinking of all these heavy thoughts are coming right i'm going to lose my job i won't be able to pay my rent i won't be able to pay the bills and what will i do i need to you know shift out of the house and <coughs> i'm thinking of all these things i will search for a job and then as i'm you know this heaviness i'm just riding back home and it's so dark right and dark in the sense you know spiritually just feeling so oppressed heavy and just began to just praise the lord at that time this thought came you know why don't you just praise the lord why don't you just confess the word why don't you declare the word right just started praising god lord i thank you that you know you leave me in a triumphant procession in christ jesus lord i just thank you and praise you because i'm fearfully and wonderfully made god i thank you and praise you that you knit me god because i i'm facing you know i'm just going through all these thoughts of self pity and i'm useless and failure and all that and just beginning to you know thank the lord praise the lord i'm saying i'm more than a conqueror in christ jesus right and and all these things and by the time i reached home i realized that all this darkness all this weight of oppression i was completely delivered right so that was my first time you know experience of using scripture and just praising praising god you know the the whole uh, you know this thing just came alive oh i can praise god and i don't have to go under the circumstance i can praise god and i don't have to be weighed down by depression or you know these oppressive thoughts you now there's clarity and freedom and liberty the minute i start praising god you know that that truth just came to me in a clear and fresh way so so this is something that we can experience personally in our lives that we begin to praise god right not just you know saying something for the sake of saying but you praise god with the understanding that this is who he is right praise god with the understanding of what he's done through scripture another time you know this happened was when i had just finished my post graduate studies and uh, i i went and i wrote the exam i actually did very uh, very badly in one paper in the first semester okay this course post graduate course was for four semesters first paper first semester uh, failed in that paper didn't write the area kept kept it till the last semester and what happened was last semester i had got campus placement so but in order to get the job you need to clear everything right you need to you can't just go with an area they won't give you the job so i got placed in campus but it was a good job all that but then this last paper is there right and so anyway i was full fully tensed wrote the exam but i got stuck in one problem for more than 20 minutes one problem 20 minutes and then i just suddenly realized oh god i'm not you know i just took 20 minutes for this one one answer one problem and then i have the rest of the time to finish the rest and so very quickly you know i just rushed through the rest but when i finished submitted the paper and went back i was like feeling so so low i thought i thought definitely this time also i'm going to fail i don't know what's going to happen and so again this you know whole thing of heaviness right i could not eat because i had planned a lot of things you know 
get the job, go, and, and all those things, uh, everything will be messed up because of this one paper. And I was like kicking myself mentally. Why didn't I write it earlier? You know, why did I wait till the last semester? All that. And it's so heavy. Right? Then I did something. I just took the Bible and I was just reading it very casually. Right? Very casually. Just like how you would read a comic book, how you would read a storybook. I'm just reading. Okay, and reading about uh, Abraham. Okay, I see that. Okay, God, you're speaking to Abraham. You were with Abraham. Uh, with Isaac. Yeah, yes, Lord, you're with Isaac. Yeah, he went through all these things. You were with, oh, you were with Jacob. Okay, I'm just reading. You know, just like I'm just flipping pages. Pages are just landing on each character. And, and I'm just reading it. And I'm saying, God, yeah, you are there. You are with him. By the end of it, was this understanding that people went through difficult times, much more difficult times than what I was experiencing or what I was expect, expecting to happen, though it has not happened. But God was with them throughout. God was with them. In the fire, God was with them. With Daniel, God was with them. He went through difficult times, yes, God was with them. They went through prison, Paul and Silas, God was with them. So this whole understanding, right? And then, then I began to speak out. I said, God, you were with them and you are with me. And you will be with me even though I might mess up, I might go through, you know, I might fail, whatever, but you will be with me. And if you are with me, and that's more than enough, right? You will somehow help me to come out of it you will somehow rebuild my life. You will somehow restore my life. You are with me, God. And that's more than enough. I just started to just thank the Lord, praise the Lord. And that, again, that whole thing lifted. Right? So when we praise God from the revelation, from the understanding who He is, and when we praise God personally, when we go through difficult times, He causes divine deliverance. He causes, he brings about divine deliverance, right? We are, we are freed from that oppression. We are freed from the lies of the enemy. Many times the enemy puts lies or, or we buy into the lies of the enemy. And like I did, you know, I was fearful, afraid, even before that thing happened, right? It was all in my mind. I was assuming. And finally, when the results came, I actually cleared, right? So... But at that moment, God causes deliverance when we acknowledge who God is, when we praise Him. Right? So that's the thing that we see that praise causes divine deliverance. Right? So praise is a weapon. And praise is not just a weapon because we say some words, but it comes from our heart, comes from our spirit, with the understanding, with the revelation of who God is, right? with the intimacy, with the relationship of who God is. We've experienced that. Okay. Third thing that we see is that praise stops the enemy. This is in, you know, in, in connection with what we saw earlier. Psalm 8 and verse 2, it says, Out of the mouth of babes and infants, you have ordained praise, ordained strength. And it says, because... Um, just one second, please. Because of the enemies, that you may silence the enemy and the avenger. Right? So praise is a weapon, it silences the enemy, it stops the enemy, it stops the work of the enemy. Right? So we are talking about something that we are preempting. What does preempting mean? What does preempt? So before the thing happens, you have already planned for it. Right? You just think, okay. I'm preempting, okay, it might rain, so I'm taking the umbrella. So you're preempting it. So praise silences the work of the enemy, cancels the assignment of the enemy. It's like preempting it. Okay, I'm going to praise God now, right? I'm preempting. Okay, whatever the enemy might plan, whatever enemy might weapon that he he might you know, rise up against me, I'm preempting it, I'm declaring it null and void by my praise. Right? Praise silences. The enemy. Okay, and the Lord Jesus, he quoted, he quotes this in Matthew 21 and verse 16. Okay, Matthew chapter 21, verse 16, when um, 
when they ask him when, they, when he's you know when the triumphant en entry into Jerusalem, and um, so they ask him you know why don't you keep, ask them to keep quiet, right? Because everyone is shouting out, uh, "Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord," and um, and then in verse twenty one the Lord, um, sorry, twenty one and verse sixteen. Sorry, sorry, verse sixteen. Yeah. So the Lord says you know. Um, the people are saying, you know, do you hear what they are, they are saying? And Jesus said to them, yes, have you not read? And he's quoting this psalm, right? Out of the mouth of babes and nursing infants, you have perfected praise or you have ordained praise, right? So, so this is something that the Lord Jesus also quoted from Scripture. It's, it silences the enemy. It ordains strength. And uh, praise is something that does that. So we are privileged to do the same thing you know in our personal lives right okay the fourth thing that we see when we praise him personally right when we take that time to do that what happens praise prepares our hearts to receive from god okay there's something about praise that prepares our heart it's like plowing the land for receiving the seed or receiving the rain it's like plowing right so um there's one verse, Hosea 10 and verse 11. Okay, it's, it's it's not a direct reference, but it says, Judah shall plow. Okay, Judah shall plow. Judah meaning praise. So Hosea 10 and verse 11. Okay, Ephraim is a Ephraim is a trained heifer that loves to thresh grain, but I har harness her fan neck. I will make Ephraim pull a plow. Judah shall plow. Jacob shall break, break its clods. Judah shall plow. Now, just a, a reference about praise. Judah means praise, and Judah actually kind of prepares praise, prepares our heart. Right. Um, so, how many times you know we've entered or we've gone to church? We've gone to a church service, okay, fully not prepared. In the sense we had no thought of being there. We didn't want to have anything to do with the word. We just be, we are there. You know, in our mental state is that of we want to be elsewhere. You know, why are you just thinking, why am I here? Right? But when we begin to praise him, and during the time of praise and worship, something happens. There's a softening of our heart. There's something that happens to our heart. Our heart is made tender to who God is. So praise does that. Praise actually prepares our hearts, prepares us to receive what God might have to say, speak to us. Right? So no wonder, like in all our gatherings, we have a time of praise and ministering unto God. Right? It really prepares the hearts of people. Yes, we are called to enter into the presence of God, enter into his courts with praise and thanksgiving. And it actually prepares the hearts of everyone, all the individuals gathered to receive from him. Right? Prepares, positions our heart to hear from God. Right? Okay. So all these things happen, and it's a journey that we make in our personal time of praise, in our personal time of worship. Okay. Any, any questions here? Any thoughts? Any questions? Excuse me. Okay, so I just want to encourage us to to spend that personal time. Okay, not think of praise and worship as time when we just gather together, but in our personal time to praise God, in our personal time to draw near to God, right, and to and to praise Him and worship Him in all these ways, right, and especially with the Word and and uh, also praying in the Spirit, singing in tongues, and so on. Okay. Now let's look at, um, if there are no questions, let's look at corporate worship or congregational worship. Okay. So as, as important as personal time of worship is to us, so also the time of congregational or corporate worship. So corporate meaning, corporate actually means body, right? Corp, body, corpus. The so corporate worship is as a body we are gathered to. Worship him, praise him. Okay, so when we consider the corporate worship, there are two aspects to it. One is 
the vertical aspect, which means what happens between us and God, right? The vertical aspect, which is, you know, up and down. So there's something that happens when people are gathered together to offer up praise and worship to God. Okay, so the Bible talks about the fact that we are here to minister unto God. Okay, minister to God, to bless God, to praise Him, to thank Him. And our primary purpose okay, as a body is to offer up spiritual sacrifices. Okay? Um, let's look at um, uh, that verse again, 1 Peter. Okay, 1 Peter chapter 2. <clears throat> okay, 1 Peter chapter 2. Verse 5, you also, as living stones, are being built up a spiritual house. Okay, so who is he referring to? All of us, believers, each one of us as living, to living stones in the spiritual house that is being built up, which is the house of God. Right? You also, as living stones, are being built up a spiritual house. Then it talks about the other things, a holy priest priesthood, etc., for what? For what are we built, built up as a spiritual house? To offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So as we gather together as a church, right? we are gathered to offer up spiritual sacrifices collectively. Right? While we do offer spiritual sacrifices personally because we are you know, kings and priests unto God, we offer spiritual sacrifices collectively because we are a spiritual house and this is this is who we are this is what we are being built up for to offer spiritual sacrifices okay and then that verse that we looked at verse 9 it says a holy generation and all that right uh, the second part of it that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light so Praises, proclaim the praises. That word used there means virtues, right? Characteristics of him, qualities of him, right? So, as a spiritual house, we are all part of that spiritual house as living stones, and we are all gathered as a spiritual house to offer up spiritual sacrifices. Okay, so if somebody asks you, hey, why are you doing this? And I remember a professor of mine who came to uh, one of our you know gatherings, and he was very su surprised. You know, why do people sing? He asked. Oh, why are you singing? And how come everybody knows the songs and, and so on, right? So we, we might think, okay, maybe that is what we do. Have, have you ever thought of it? You know, why do we gather together? Why do we sing? But this is it. Because we are a spiritual house and we are offering up spiritual sacrifices to Him, right? And it says, proclaim Him, the praises of Him collectively, right? Which means the virtues of Him, characteristics of Him collectively. Okay, so this is what we do. We, we are called to minister unto God to offer up these spiritual sacrifices. Second thing that happens is that we, uh, we become aware of the manifest presence of God corporately. Okay. We are here, we are there you know, together as a corporate body to, to realize or become aware or to experience the presence of God together as a corporate body. And and that is something that uh, that happens, you know, corporately when we when we when we read about uh, the temple that Solomon built, and they experience the manifest presence of God. In the book of Acts, also we see that they gather together and they are praying, and it says the place where they had gathered together was shaken. Literally, right? It just meant that. There was the power of God present among them as a body. Right? So God does amazing things when we gather together as a body in order to bless Him, in order to, in order to minister to Him. You know? Another example that we see is that people receive direction and commissioning um, for missions. And that again happened when they ministered to God. Okay, we see that in Acts chapter, I think it's the church in Antioch. And um, I think it's Acts chapter, yeah, Acts chapter 13, okay? Acts chapter 13, verse 2, it says, And as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said. Okay, and what the Holy Spirit said, 
the instruction that the Holy Spirit gave at that time was something which was crucial. That started Paul and Barnabas on the first missionary journey, right? They, something like this was not, not done in the early church. They, they went intentionally on the missionary journey and planting of churches happened, building up of people, leaders, all that happened, right? So how did it start? They, they were actually ministering to the Lord. They were having this time of fasting and prayer and they were ministering to the Lord. And so that happens when we, when we experience the presence of God, when we minister unto the Lord, right? Third thing also is that it provides the environment, okay, and the atmosphere, the environment for the use of the spiritual gifts. Okay. Now, now, you should not get me wrong, right? Spiritual gifts or the gifts of the Spirit can be used anywhere, not only in church. Yes or no? Yeah, right? Tongues, word of knowledge, prophecy, gift of faith, healings, everything. It is actually, you know, for the benefit of everyone. So that is the expression of the Holy Spirit. So it's meant for use anywhere, anytime, any place, right? But in the so also in the body of Christ, right? So it provides the right environment because it talks about one Corinthians fourteen talks about the yeah. You have a question. You have a question now, Vinay. You have a question. So 1 Corinthians 14 talks about the fact that they gather together and they are prophesying and they are ministering to one another and someone comes in who does not know the Lord and realizes, hey, God is real. The secrets of his heart are revealed and he falls down and worship. Okay. So the gifts of the Spirit, done in the right way, right? Uh, for the benefit of all, in the body, when we are gathered together, worship provides the right environment. Worship draws us to God. Worship makes us hungry for more of God. Uh, we experience the presence of God, and um, it's the right environment. It provides the right environment for the, or the conducive environment for the gifts of the Spirit to be released among us. Right. Um, so, so that is that is also something that happens when we worship the Lord uh, corporately. So we're talking about the vertical aspect, right? So which is, what is vertical? North, south, right? Up and down, right? Then the second aspect of what happens when we worship the Lord corporately is a horizontal aspect, which means left to right, which means, you know, among people, okay? So what happens here? There is a sense of unity that comes about. You know, when people gather together to sing praise to God, there is a sense of unity. You realize that, hey, I'm here, I'm standing together with, you know, different kinds of people from different nationalities, maybe, you know, different languages, different states, and we are worshipping one God. Right? I remember, you know, being in a church like that, and and suddenly I just felt at home. Right? It was, it was not, you know, it was not hometown. Different place, different languages, different nationalities, even. But I felt at home because we were worshiping this one Lord, one God. And several times you realize that, hey, we're all one. We're all one body. So there is a sense of unity that comes about when we worship in spirit and truth, right? Our God together. So the one thing that we have in common is, well, the Lord Jesus, the cross. And so it brings about a sense of unity. And so, which means that disunity or barriers are broken down. Because it's very difficult, right? And there are barriers, when there are walls, when there are you know, things that we are holding against grudges and offenses and all that, we're not able to worship as one. But when we begin to worship, you know, maybe with all these barriers, maybe with all these you know, even with all these offenses and all that, you begin to worship, and the Lord works in our heart, and then you realize, hey, this is my, this is my brother, this is my sister, right? I, I, I remember one particular time. I don't know if I shared this. I'm sorry if I'm repeating, but uh, we had this time of extended time of worship, this 40 days of seeking God, right? Every evening we'd gather together, two hours of just worshiping the Lord and prayer and so on, as a church. So. There was one person who came there, and he had um, he had very severe differences with his wife, like 
conflicts with his wife severe like on the verge of on the verge of breaking on the verge of separating so he came that particular day and you know he's just worshiping and just this is just completely surrendered himself to god and and the next next day i get a text you know saying you know the pastor something happened something wonderful happened you know all my hatred towards my wife all my hatred towards my wife just disappeared you know i know that she's not perfect i know that we have fought in the past and all these things but but somehow god put a new love a fresh love right and understanding for my wife and so uh, you know this time of just seeking god um, together there was this this thing that happened it was like a surgery like a spiritual surgery right and god removed all that was unnecessary and wasteful and things that were causing harm removed all that and brought about this you know you know breaking down of barrier that was there in his life which is so real and he said you know the things has changed that evening right was for no reason it was a supernatural work of god in my heart he just filled me with this love for my wife right so we see that barriers which bring disunity barriers which cause you know which are there which cause division those are broken when we truly draw near together in order to worship god right so that is something that happens we minister to one another in song you know we build each other up we encourage one another when we when we worship the lord there are times when we pray for one another when we you know and, and maybe there's a release of gifts and then we we declare god's you know god's word um word of knowledge maybe prophecy one another um the third thing that we see is that there is also this reinforcement of spiritual truth okay and um the best way i can describe it is you know Uh, there was a season in my life when i was living a double life right a life of compromise and trying to live a life that is spiritual right many years ago now during the time of worship corporate worship and i remember it was a good friday service and i was struggling with some areas of my life in sin and and i was in this good friday service and as we were singing you know it was singing we were singing the song um and the words of the song go like this you know um jesus died and rose again simple everybody knows right it was a, it was a hill song um the song by hill song and it it's like uh from the waters you arise and um, and i forget the title of the song i think it's um, anyway so the, the line goes like this jesus died and rose again so and suddenly this this truth this understanding Hey, if he died and rose again then my sin is taken if he died and rose again his body of sin is destroyed if he died and rose again romans chapter 6 talks about how sin shall not have dominion over you you know that's that is true right so it was so empowering you know i was broken down but it was at the same time so empowering that jesus died and rose again and at that moment i realized that you know i don't have to struggle with sin because he has already paid the price he rose again victorious you know having dealt with sin and death and so on so so it's a reiteration when we sing these songs in worship or when we you know proclaim these truths in worship we are we teach our each we teach each other and ourselves these deep spiritual truths the holy spirit reveals this to us right so these truths of scripture these truth of maybe some deep doctrines you know most of these hymns that we sing like these old songs these old hymns are doctrines spiritual do- or you know truths and teachings from scripture which are actually set to tune right so doctrines on forgiveness doctrines on healing doctrines on you know the holy spirit and all that we actually sing sing this out therefore the importance of singing songs that are in line with the word of god right so i'm sure you would, you would have heard that song called no longer slaves okay how many of you heard that song no longer slaves i think you should hear it right you should listen to it talks about how we are no longer slaves because we are born again because we are in the family of god 
right? And uh, and then the bridge section talks about how he has made a way, and for us to walk through those waters and so on. So, so songs like this reiterate spiritual truth to us. We're not just singing it. You know, this truth comes to us. We are reminded, hey, yes, this is it. This is what it is. It makes sense to us, right? So, uh, it's a time for us to 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 be reinforced with spiritual truth. Okay, what else happens? It provides this corporate time of worship, provides believers, provides all, our, all of us to profess our faith, verbally declare the glory of God, verbally shout it out. There's something that happens when you and I open our mouths and praise God, rather than keeping it inside, rather than being quiet about it. There's something, there's a release that happens when we actually open our mouths and shout it out, open our mouths and sing it out, right? So you, you, you try that, right? Maybe you, it's a song that you want to, you know, in, in your personal time, you know, just try not singing a particular thing or not saying, you know, the praises of God out loud. And you see the difference when you actually do it, when you actually praise, when you actually, you know, with your whole heart, Maybe even declare it, shout it out loud. There's a difference, right? First thing you experience, your mood changes. You're feeling better already, right? Because there is a connection between what you speak and what you emotionally, what you go go through, right? There is a connection between your emotions and between the words that you speak. So you are declaring, speaking out loud the praises of God. Immediately, there's a change. Right? And so all the other things that happen as well, you know, what we saw earlier. But the thing is, it provides an opportunity for us corporately to shout out, to sing out, to proclaim the praises of God. Okay. So uh, I know, you know, in Bible college and church, you know, we are we're all, you know, from different backgrounds. So I come from a background where we did not do that. We did not speak out spontaneously. You know, we, we did not speak out or thank God from our heart. It was all prayers that we read in a book, right? And we read it out very solemnly, very quietly, right? That is how we pray. That is how we interacted with God. So the time when I realized that, hey, you can actually open your mouth and praise Him and shout out and thank, there was so much of freedom and liberty that I experienced in my spirit and in my soul, emotionally as well. Right, so that is something. So there's an opportunity for us to do that. And when somebody who's leading worship says, "You know, why don't we lift our voices and why don't we shout out praise or why don't we just begin to praise?" You know, that's the time to really do that. You know, not hold back. Right? Okay. And uh, lastly, it provides an uh, atmosphere to uh, preach the word of God. Like again, collectively, hearts are prepared. And to receive the word of God. Okay, so there is the inward aspect as well. You know, very quickly, just go through that. Um, so it it enables people. That is something that we were seeing. You know, it enables people to release the praises of God in an uninhibited expression. Un, what does uninhibited mean? Unrestrained, without holding back, right? And um, there's so much of joy and freedom when we do that. Secondly, a verbal expression of feelings in our hearts. Okay, so maybe you feel something in your heart, but you have not expressed it. Okay, you you have a you feel something in your heart for God, but you have not expressed it. What does expressing it mean? You speaking it out, telling Him that out of your mouth. You know, we are all able to speak and communicate, but then it's locked up in our hearts, and it's not really released to God. There's no verbal expression, right? So inwardly, there is change when we actually verbally express praise to God. You know, the songs help us, right? So whatever is in our heart, we are able to sing it out, we are able to say it out, speak it out. Okay. And it also, thirdly, you know, there, there could be many things, but thirdly, it also inspires us to live a life of a greater commitment, to live a life of worship as well. Okay, okay. So quickly, if you need to summarize it, we minister to God 
in congregational worship, right? Secondly, it brings a sense of unity among us, right? Uh, and the songs that we sing as a congregation help us to learn, help us to teach, reinforce a spiritual truth uh, to one another and to us as well, um, and personally. And also, it prepares our heart, provides an atmosphere for preaching of the word, to receive the word of God, and also for the release of the gifts and also enables us to express feelings in our heart of you know, intimate worship to express it in an uninhibited, uninhibited manner. Okay, so, so we see that there is great value in corporate worship. You know, it could, it could be 15 minutes, it could be 10 minutes, but there's great value. So we need to treat this time of corporate worship for what it truly is and not use it as a Filler. Like many places, you know, even in I know spiritual churches, use it as a filler. Filler meaning, you know, time. There is some time. Let's fill it, fill the gap. You know, we'll sing two songs, fill the gap, and then. You know. But it can be a powerful time because all this exchange happens spiritually. Powerful time for the congregation. A powerful time to invite the presence of God to deal with us, and especially. You know, when it comes to a time of ministry, right? Maybe the message is done and there is a time ministering, a time of ministry where we invite the presence, the power of God to make changes right deep in our in our lives, in our bodies, in our minds. It's a powerful time when congregationally we invite the Holy Spirit to come and make changes, right? To to heal, to deliver, and all those things. So even during the ministry time, it is a very powerful time of worship and corporately when we do this together. Right? Okay, any questions? Any doubts? Any questions? Okay, so, um, so we looked at personal, corporate. So let's um, hopefully, you know, it motivates us to, to journey in this. Right? If we have, if we have not really pursued this in our lives, let's do that, right? Okay, we'll stop here, and uh, we'll meet again next week. Thank you.